So let us uh, continue where we left off uh, yesterday. Uh, and uh, and you may remember we were talking about the idea of uh, uh, defilements that are to be uh, given up by seeing, dasana, pahatava, asava. And uh, the idea, of course, is seeing is a, is a way of looking at right view. So it's a way of developing right view of seeing the world in the right way. And then through that, then you abandon uh, defilements, etc. Uh, the idea of uh, right view in Buddhism is very broad. And uh, as I've been trying to point out, it is very much the foundation of the entire Buddhist path. Uh, it is the first factor of uh, the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, and it is also the uh, root of a dependent origination. Yeah, dependent origination starts off with uh, delusion. Uh, and of course, as you uh, uh, give rise to right view, what you're doing is you're giving up delusion in a sense. Uh, so that is what is happening when we uh, practice, uh, when we try to understand and see things more clearly here. Uh, so because that right view is so fundamental in Buddhism, because it is the basis on which uh, everything else is uh, developed, uh, I want to uh, look at this uh, even more in a bit more detail. Uh, you could argue, of course, that all the suttas of the Buddha are really right to view. Everything really is about looking at the world in the right way, including how to meditate properly, how to practice properly. Uh, but there are some things that are more uh, linked to right view than others. So, and that is how we should think about the world, the kind of outlook that we should have, uh, how we um, relate to the things around us. So, and when we relate to the things around us in the right way, then that uh, changes our values. Uh, yeah, our, our values will always align with how we look at the world, uh, how we look at the world is the uh, will give us importance of certain things will become important to us. So that will be our values and our values will give our priorities. We start to prioritize in a new way. Uh, and then we um, practice and we live according to our priorities. So, so uh, let us uh, have a look, a little bit of a look at uh, uh, the uh, one of these suttas that the deal very much with how to uh, reflect and how to think about the world in the right way. Uh, and this particular sutta is from the uh, numerical discourses. Uh, you can see it there on the screen, uh, AN749. Uh, AN again is the uh, Anguttara Nikaya, numerical discourses. Uh, seven is a uh, chapter seven, and this is sutta uh, 49 among those discourses. Uh, and uh, uh, this particular sutta has uh, seven aspects to it. Uh, I'm going to look at four of those uh, seven here, uh, because some of these are more um, useful than others. And if you look up the rest uh, now, you have the reference. You can go straight to Sutta Central or whatever you like, and you can actually look at these uh, uh, suttas for yourself and see what you think about the rest of it if you are interested there. Anyway, so what uh, does the Buddha say here? This is uh, uh, what he says. Uh, it was said that the perception of non-delight in the entire world, uh, because uh, when developed and cultivated, is of great fruit and benefit, uh, culminating in the deathless, uh, having the deathless uh, as its consummation. consummation uh, for what reason was this said? When a bhikkhu, yeah, or it could be a bhikkhuni, or a lay person, or whoever really, uh, when a bhikkhu often dwells with a mind accustomed to the perception of non-delight in the entire world, uh, their mind shrink away from the world's beautiful things, uh, turn away from them, roll away from them, and is drawn towards them, not drawn towards them. Uh, and either equanimity or aversion or revulsion, in this case, uh, become settled in them. Just as a rooster's feather or a strip of sinew uh, thrown into a fire shrinks away from it, turns back from it uh, and rolls away from it uh, and is not drawn towards it, uh, so it is in regard to the world's beautiful things. Uh, when a bhikkhu often dwells with a mind accustomed uh, to the perception of non-delight in the entire world. 
So this is a, a particular way of thinking about the world or perceiving the world. And we see this in a number of places in the suttas. And in the Pali, it is called the Sabha Loke Anabhirati Sanya. And uh, uh, so and basically it means, Anabhirati means that you are kind of uninterested, you don't delight in it. And what you don't delight in is basically anything in the world. The whole world seems like not all that interesting to you. And so this, um, you can see here what, what it says then, if you actually do develop this particular perception and what it does, it means that your mind turns away from the beautiful things in the world. Yeah, you lose your interest for what is happening in the world and you turn away from that. And of course, this is uh, fundamental. It really allows you to go inside. It allows you to give up the senses, the attachment to that world. Uh, and then it allows you to move towards Samadhi instead. Uh, because that attachment to the world is obviously one of the main factors. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, that blocks us from accessing Samadhi and making the mind really peaceful and calm. Uh, so exactly how do we do this? What, what exactly does this mean in practice? Uh, and uh, what it means is that uh, the entire external world outside of us ultimately uh, is not really all that interesting. Yeah? It is contemplating, reminding yourself of the downside of the world outside. Uh, and one of the ways of uh, doing this is to ask yourself, well, what are the things in the world that you are attached to? Uh, what are the things outside that you would be upset about if it changed, for example? What are the things that are, you know, really matter to you in this world? And it can be many things. It can be certain things in the world that you regard as beautiful, maybe a spot in nature that you find very attractive. And I remember the last few years when I have been to KL and visiting the BGF, we went off to one of the little forest reserves yeah and you walk through the jungle there and, and it's very attractive uh, yeah it's very nice but it is also impermanent it is also unreliable it will change it will change this ch shape maybe it will become more uh, dilapidated as time goes by people won't look after it properly maybe uh, eventually and eventually it might get torn down maybe some dodgy property developer gets access to it uh, who knows what will happen in the future? That's one thing we do know, however, uh, it is going to be impermanent. Uh, eventually, it is going to be gone. Uh, so, uh, and so everything that we delight in, in that external world, uh, beautiful nature, it could be ideas that we delight in. Yeah? I mean, Buddhism itself, in a sense, exists in that external world in one way, in the sense that we rely on Buddhist institutions uh, we rely on the uh, Tipitaka to be available to us. Uh, and in that sense, even Buddhism is uh, uncertain. So how attached are you to the Buddhist teachings? How attached are you to having a beautiful place like the BGF center in KL or any other Buddhist center that you may uh, delight in? Uh, or maybe even Bodhinyana Monastery, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, or the BSWA here in Perth, or your monastery in Thailand, or whatever it might be. How attached are you to these things? If these things disappear, if these things were to gradually decline and disappear, how do you feel about that? And so all of these things in the external world, and you have to really ask yourself, you know, what are the things that you are attached to? What about your the place where you grew up as a child, when you go back there and everything is changing and kind of disappearing, what does that feel like? Does that feel a bit sad maybe, or a bit uh, difficult to deal with him? You know, when I go back to my uh, original home country of Norway, it feels so different. I haven't lived in Norway now for, what is it, over 30 years. Uh, and when I go back, I'm not sure if it is quite the same place anymore. Uh, so how do I deal with that? Uh, Am I able to just let that go and allow things to be there? And uh, so by looking at these things, look, remembering that everything in that world, uh, anything that you hear, anything that you see, uh, any idea that you have relating to that world, uh, it could be uh, you know, uh, things like uh, even the way that the country is governed, for example, or uh, uh, you know, whatever it is in that world that you're attached to. It can be the culture that you come from. Uh, 
you know, often we are attached to a certain culture, we think that we belong to a certain culture, uh, and of course that culture itself uh, is impermanent and unreliable, uh, and will only last for so long, uh, and then it will be gone, uh, yeah, so we are holding on to things that are inherently problematic, yeah. So when you, the more you understand that that whole world outside is, uh, uh, is uncertain, uh, is, uh, cannot be held on to, uh, the more you feel a sense of, oh, it is kind of almost, it is heavy, it is, a, you get a sense of repulsion towards all of that, because you know that if you hold on to it, only one thing is going to happen, uh, you're going to suffer because of that holding on. Uh. So this is the um, purpose behind this kind of um, uh, contemplation. And of course, it is not just the world at large outside, the kind of impersonal world and the impersonal forces. Uh, it is also your private world itself will also be problematic. And yeah, our families, our ownerships and all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, there comes a point when that whole world of the five sets is everything that you get from outside, uh, you realize that that whole world is problematic, it is difficult, uh, and you turn away from that, uh, and uh, to the point where you actually uh, don't not really all that interested anymore in even seeing and hearing, you see, seeing and hearing and touching and experiencing that world, uh, all of that seems to you as a uh, deeply problematic, deeply uh, um, a causal force, a causal factor for your suffering. Why? Well, because you're attached to it. Uh, and that's why it is problematic. Yeah. So um, remember, this doesn't mean necessarily that you have to make any drastic changes to your life. Yeah, it doesn't mean that now you have to give up everything in the world. That's not really the point of this. Uh, the point is just to have a, a slight change in perception, uh, seeing things from a slightly different angle. So you let go a little bit. Uh, and when you let go a little bit, uh, you find a little bit more peace in the meditation. When you find a little bit more peace, uh, you let go a little bit more, yeah? And you gradually develop your mind in this way. Uh, but uh, uh, allow it to happen naturally. Uh, um, I think it is quite obvious that this sort of uh, reflection is true. Yeah, we know that it is true. We know everything in the world has to change. Uh, we know that there comes a point in history when everything we have now will be completely forgotten yeah it will be gone it is like how far back do we know human history and if you go beyond a few thousand years everything is very gray and very uncertain we don't know much about it and certainly if you go back to past eons we don't know anything at all about what happens in past eons so it doesn't take that long before everything is gone so what is there to hold on to now there's nothing there of real value, huh? and then you abandon it, you let it go, you gradually uh, decrease your attachment to these things. So, so uh, and this is why it, it says here in this particular sutta that you, uh, by thinking in this way, uh, uh, it is like your mind that turns away from those things, it turns back, it rolls away, it withdraws yeah, from them. Uh, and then either equanimity or revulsion becomes established in that person who thinks in this way. Either you become equanimous, yeah, you realize that that world is best left alone, you're neither attached nor are you um, averse to it. But uh, a more a preliminary feeling is that you feel a sense of aversion, a sense of revulsion, because you know all of this is inherent, inherently suffering. And of course, when you know that something is suffering, Basically, you don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. You withdraw back. Yeah? Your mind draws away from that. Uh, so again, uh, you allow this to happen gradually, stage by stage. Uh, and eventually, you may actually come to this kind of uh, a view uh, of, of, of relating to, that, of, to the entire world of the five senses. Uh. So uh, then you have this nice little simile, yeah, or like a feather. Do you know what it's like when you put a feather to a fire, the feather kind of curls back? Yeah, it curls back yeah, because uh, that is the nature of the feather when you uh, keep it close to a fire. Um, so you have no longer any interest in the world's beautiful things because you understand how inherently problematic they, they are. Yeah. And then the Buddha goes on. If, when a bhikkhu often dwells with a mind accustomed uh, to the perception of non-delight in the entire world, uh, if his mind inclines to the world's beautiful things, uh, 
or if it does not turn away from them, uh, he should understand that I have not developed the perception of non-delight in the entire world. Uh, there is no distinction between my earlier condition and my present one. Uh, I have not attained the fruit of development. Uh, thus, he clearly comprehends this. So, um, uh, you, this is like the ideal, you know, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we're trying to achieve a point where the mind just turns away. And maybe this is a very monastic kind of perception because uh, it might be more difficult to develop this in lay life, at least fully. But if you develop it fully, according to this, then you, your mind always turns away from the world. Uh, and of course, you can imagine that that will make samadhi, yeah, make meditation quite easy because you have no interest in the external things. Uh, so it's easy for the mind to turn inside instead. Uh, so you can see why this is a very useful perception. Uh, but be gentle. Yeah? It is always so important not to overdo these kind of things. Uh, we try to make it a natural progression uh, when you see these things. Uh, and uh, then uh, you will gradually, you will uh, achieve this kind of uh, state where you, you don't really have that uh, interest anymore. Now, there is no distinction between my earlier condition and my present one. This just means that you are, you know, you haven't really achieved what you're trying to achieve. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and then it says, uh, then you comprehend this. The idea here is that uh, what is comprehension? Some pajano. So you are always, you always have a degree of clarity about what is going on with you. You know whether you're heading in the right way or not. Uh, you are clear about how your development of your mind is happening. Uh, one of those uh, fundamental parts of uh, Buddhism, yeah, Sampajanya, clear comprehension, understanding what we're doing and whether it is actually working. Uh, such an important part of the path. Uh, yeah, you are aware of what is going on uh, and you understand whether the practice practice actually is bearing the results that it should be here. So you're always monitoring yourself, monitoring your mind and seeing what is happening inside of you. And then the Buddha goes on, but if when uh, you often dwell with a mind accustomed to the perception of non-delight in the entire world, uh, if your mind shrinks away from the world's beautiful things, etc., etc., and then either equanimity or revulsion becomes settled in you. And you should understand, I have developed the perception of non-delight in the entire world. There is a distinction between my earlier condition and my present one. I have attained the fruit of development. Thus, you clearly comprehend this. So there comes a point, uh, yeah, ideally uh, down the track when you are, your mind is firmly established in this kind of perception, understanding the non-reliability, the uh, impermanence in all things, how it is always changing, that as soon as you hold on to something, uh, you have a problem, because as soon as you hold on to something, uh, that thing which you hold on to will change and become otherwise, uh, and then you will suffer as a consequence. Uh, the whole world seems non-delightful to you in one way or another because of this. And down the track, you have attained the fruit of that development. And when you attain that fruit, you are clearly aware of what is happening here. So when it was said that the perception of non-delight in the entire world, because bhikkhunis, upasakas, upasakas, when developed and cultivated, is of great fruit and benefit culminating in the deathless, uh, having the deathless as its consummation. Uh, it is because of this uh, that this was said. I really like this uh, conclusion here, that it is of great fruit and benefit, uh, culminating in the deathless. Uh, of course, the deathless here being basically Nibbana. Uh, so these kind of perceptions are obviously surprising yet powerful. Yeah, you may have thought that uh, Thinking like this is not going to take you all the way to Nibbana. It may seem too much. Yeah, how can that possibly be the case? But remember that what you are doing here is that you're overcoming one of the biggest problems on the Buddhist path. Yeah? The biggest problem, really, I think, is always attachment to the sensory world. And if you can reduce that attachment, it gives you access to this alternative world of the mind, the world of the mind 
which is samadhi, which is calm, which is samatha, which is this inner bliss and inner joy, which is beyond the ordinary world of the five senses. And this is what this does. It gives you access to that. And once you get to that world of the, the beyond the world of the five senses, to the world of the mind, then you are very close to Nibbana already. If you remember that famous verse from the Dhammapada, which says that one who has jhana, uh, has wisdom, and one who has wisdom uh, has jhana, and one who has both of these is in the vicinity of nibbana. So, in other words, if you have a, a jhana states, if you have given up the world outside, uh, you are very, you have already have a lot of wisdom because you have understood a, a very large part of the problem in the world. Uh, so, this perception is developing that wisdom, yeah, understanding the drawbacks of the world, uh, seeing uh, the problem, problem, problems, problems. Uh, of this particular thing. And as you do that, uh, you then, uh, it enables you to move your mind forward on the path. Uh. So let's move on to the next uh, uh, perception. Uh, yeah, and this is uh, uh, very similar to the previous one, but it is a little bit more broad perhaps. Uh, yeah, And uh, so let's uh, uh, see what this one says. It was said the perception of impermanence because uh, what developed and cultivated is of great fruit and great benefit, uh, culminating in the deathless, having the deathless as its consummation. Uh, for what reason was this said? Uh, when a bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, upasaka, upasaka often dwells with a mind accustomed to the perception of impermanence, uh, then their mind shrinks away from gain, honor, and praise. Uh, turn back from them, roll away from them, uh, and is not drawn towards them. Uh, and either equanimity or revulsion becomes settled in them. Uh, just as a rooster's feather again, or a strip of sinew thrown into a fire, shrinks away from it, uh, turns back from it, uh, rolls away from it, uh, and is not drawn towards it. Uh, so it is in regard to the world, to the gain, honor, and praise. Uh, when someone often dwells with a mind accustomed to the perception of impermanence. So um, here we are talking about uh, understanding impermanence in a perhaps not the deepest sense. Yeah, this is more like a, a more ordinary idea of impermanence. Uh, later on, I will talk about impermanence when it is developed in meditation practice. Uh, seeing the mind as impermanent, seeing the body as impermanent. Uh, but here it is more like understanding impermanence in a way which uh, again detaches us from the world, uh, yeah, which makes the world seem less interesting. Uh, and here it specifically focuses on gain, honor and fame, Lamba, Sakara, Siloka in Pali, Lamba, gain. And Sakara is like honor and people, you know, uh, whatever, and then praise, which is a, a siloka, which also means like fame, if you like, or uh, and these kind of things, uh, yeah. So one of the, of course, the point behind this is to again understand how everything that we achieve in this world, uh, yeah, whether it is things outside of us, the gain that we have, or it is things that have to do with our status, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting how we always Everyone would like to be honored and praised. Yeah, we would like to be told, yeah, you are so marvelous. Wow, we, we love you. You are such a wonderful person. We love to hear that praise. But the problem is that uh, once you hear praise once, you need to hear it again because the praise is so impermanent. And if you don't get to hear it again, then you wonder whether they have forgotten about the praise before. So it is like an eternal thing, always kind of looking for these things, again, chasing after them, because you know that they are so unreliable and so impermanent. If someone honors you because you are a, a good person, and all of you are good people, otherwise you wouldn't be on this retreat. But if people sort of honor you because of your, your goodness or your good qualities, or maybe just because you are powerful or whatever, then you will need to have that honor reconfirmed again and again and again if you are attached to it. Yeah, because after a while, if people don't reconfirm it, you start to wonder: Is it really true? Is it still? Is it still there? And the same thing, of course, is true for gain. The things in the world that we gain, the things that we have, 
all of that too is obviously this is inferring that uh, just as we were looking at the uh, non-delight in the entire world in exactly the same way everything that we own in this world is going to disappear here. and this is such a useful thing here yeah? the the idea why why are we so upset obsessed with these things uh, why are we obsessed with people honoring and praising us uh, why does it matter so much to us uh, what do other people know anyway do they really know us do they understand what is going on uh, if we if someone else honors us and praises us, but they don't really understand what is going on there, what's the point? What difference does it make? And if you look at the large number of people in the world who are praised and who are honored, they are the wrong people who are praised and honored. The people who are praised and honored are the movie stars and the pop stars and the, you know, the models or whatever else in the world. These are the people who are praised and honored, but do they really deserve that? Do they have the qualities of someone who really deserves to be praised? And the people who really do deserve to be praised in the world, the people who are have a beautiful character, who have a, a heart full of loving kindness, who are virtuous in the world, who really know how to live well. People like the Buddha, people like you know one of my great heroes, like Ajahn Brahm, uh, people like uh, the Aryas and the, maybe many of the monastics in the world. Uh, and some of the lay Buddhists in the world who live marvelous lives, uh, they are often not really praised or honored. Many people then kind of live in obscurity, uh, and yet they really deserve it. Uh. The world doesn't know who, who to praise and who to honor. The, the world is blind. Uh. So if someone praises you, honors you, it doesn't mean anything, usually. Uh. What do they know? They don't know anything. Uh. It's irrelevant. Uh. And uh, so because of that, uh, we, after a while, we start to realize the emptiness of these things. Uh. They don't really have any, they shouldn't really, we shouldn't grasp onto these things because we're grasping onto things that actually often are quite meaningless in the first place. If Ajahn Brahm praises you, yeah, if the Buddha praises you, if the Buddha says that you are doing really well, which it does sometimes in the suttas, okay, then it has some kind of value. Yeah, that is great. But for the vast majority of things, it has no value anyway. But even if it does have a value, one of the things about this is that it is so unreliable. Yeah, You uh, exist in this life, we exist a few years, and people remember you for a short time, uh, and then you die. Yeah? And when you die, you cannot take the honor and the praise with you. The honor and praise belongs to this world. Uh, and a generation or two after you have passed away, uh, after you have gone, uh, that all of that honor and praise, all of that gain, your entire name, your entire history as a person uh, will be erased from the history of humanity. Nobody will ever remember you again. Uh, you won't exist anymore. Uh, yeah, it's all completely gone. It is not only impermanent, uh, it is uh, fades away and leads to complete cessation as if you never existed in the first place. Uh, so why are we obsessed with honor and praise now and gain now if we know that down the track is going to be completely erased? It is not something that we can hold on to. And if we cannot hold on to these things, then it is crazy to attach to them because we know they're going to be taken away from us. So everything in this world, when we talk about the Sambha Loka Anabhirakti Sanya, we're talking about the beautiful things in the world, we're talking about the things that we attach to, in the external world, but here we're also talking about the inner things, yeah, the honor, the praise, the kind of the status that we have, maybe our education, we feel honored and praised because we are educated or we are intelligent or whatever it is. But all of that is utterly unreliable. So you withdraw from that, you turn away from that, these things, you don't allow them to really matter to you because you know you cannot take them with you anyway. Things change so fast. One day you're intelligent, and another day you are become more stupid. Yeah, intelligence is always changing in this world, and as you do that, you let go of these things, and you don't actually hold on to them anymore. Equanimity is established about these things, and you may even have an aversion towards them. Why? Because you know that this down the track is going to lead to suffering if you hold on to it. So uh, again. Yeah, so just as that uh, rooster's feather again is thrown into the fire, it kind of rolls back in the same way uh, you re uh, regard 
in regard to gain, honor, and praise uh, when anyone, bhikkhu, bhikkhuni, and whoever you are, often dwells with the mind accustomed to the perception of impermanence, uh, then the mind withdraws from these things. Uh, if, when a bhikkhu often dwells with a mind accustomed to the perception of impermanence, uh, uh, his mind uh, inclines to gain honor and praise. Uh, or if he does not turn away from them, he should understand that I have not developed the perception of impermanence. Uh, there is no distinction between my earlier condition and my present one. Uh, I have not attained the fruit of development. Uh, thus, he clearly comprehends this. Uh, yeah, you monitor your development, you look, you see if your uh, development or perception is working for you, whether it really gives the fruits and the results or not. Uh, and if it doesn't give the fruits and the results, then you uh, know that it, that hasn't been the case and you continue your development. Uh, but if, when they often dwell with a mind accustomed to the perception of impermanence, uh, if their mind shrinks away from gain, honor and praise, uh, and either equanimity or revulsion becomes established in them, uh, they should understand, I have developed the perception of impermanence. Uh, there is a distinction between my earlier condition and my present one. Uh, I have attained the fruit uh, of development. Uh, thus, you clearly comprehend uh, this. Uh, when it was said that uh, the perception of impermanence because uh, when developed and cultivated, uh, is of great fruit and great fat benefit, uh, culminating in the deathless, uh, having the deathless as its consummation. It is because of this that this was said. So again, the idea, yeah, it, it may sound uh, kind of sound maybe over the top. Yeah, all you have to do is to develop impermanence in such a way that your mind shrinks away from. Uh, gain honor and fame, you don't, you don't take that so seriously. Uh, and then uh, uh, you, you cul that culminates in the deathless. Uh, but again, the idea is that these are all the things of the world, the things that people look after. Uh, and if you shrink away from these things that make you attached to the world, uh, then again, you are moving towards samadhi, moving towards uh, the deeper aspects of the mind. Yeah, And uh, this then allows the and uh, Nibbana, the understanding, the insight to come because of that depth of the uh, meditation that you gain as a consequence of this. Uh, and if this is um, actually far, you know, th these things are very, very significant. And I am often uh, concerned when I look at the Buddhist world and I see how much uh, striving, even within the monastic community, there's often much striving for gain, honor, and fame. Uh, you know, one of the things that we see in the Buddhist world, we see a lot of hierarchies. Uh, you see, you know, the Sangha Raja on top, then you see a Buddhist hierarchy, and you see people with uh, all kinds of positions within in that hierarchy. Uh, and all of these things, they lure the monastics away from what really is important in life, and they draw you into the world. Uh, everyone wants the status of the hierarchy. Everyone wants to climb the ladder, uh, yeah, move higher up. And you, every time you hear someone has become a, uh, you know, has been given a position on this hierarchy in Thailand, and uh, they are called Chao Kuns and Pra Krus and Som Dets, and there's all the various levels on this hierarchy. And, each one of these have many different levels. Uh, and then people talk about it. I think it's marvelous and wonderful when someone has climbed this hierarchy. But actually, it is not wonderful and marvelous at all. It is a trap. It is a trap of uh, honor and fame and praise. Uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, very interesting, therefore, to look back at how the Sangha, how the monastic Sangha was established and how it was run at the time of the Buddha. It was a completely flat organization. There was no hierarchy. There weren't even abbots at the time of the Buddha, let alone the Sangha hierarchy. And uh, I think there are many, many reasons for that. But one reason is because this detracts, it destroys our ability to practice the path properly. Because the more involved you are with these things, the more you are searching for um, things in the external world, gain, honor, praise, status, yay, I am important because I have achieved this status in the world. Uh, the more we look for that, the more we are part of that, the more difficult it becomes to practice the path. Uh, of course, there are people in this world who become, who have uh, these uh, 
statuses and who are given these titles and, and it doesn't really affect them yeah it doesn't affect them because they have gone beyond that people like you know Ajahn Chah in Thailand very famous uh, meditation teachers and they're often honored by the king and some of these famous meditation teachers and but for a lot of people it is a trap it holds you back and it makes life very difficult when you are in these kind of positions so, so um, I don't know. I, I personally think uh, the Sangha uh, would be much better off having a more flat structure, uh, not so much hierarchy, but it seems like it is one of the uh, things that we do as humans. We seem to like to create hierarchies, yeah, building up these things, uh, and uh, then as a consequence of that, we then uh, uh, end up being trapped by the hierarch our hierarchies that we create. Uh, we create our own trap, uh, and then, of course, we uh, destroy so much of the potential for uh, the Buddhist path and the Buddhist practice. Uh, so, um, I uh, there's one more perception that I would like to have a look at, uh, and um, uh, this is the perception of suffering in what is impermanent. Uh, let's just have a five minute break and do a little bit of meditation for a week before we move on to this one. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, let's uh, carry on. I'm just going to have a little bit of coffee now. 
before I start again. I hope you're not too I hope you're not too jealous <coughs> of my coffee. Wow, that's really strong coffee. Okay, so uh, let us come to this uh, last one. This is uh, the per perception of uh, suffering in the impermanent. Yeah, the suffering in, uh, in whenever something is impermanent, it is unreliable, it is out of control, and then there's always going to be suffering in that. Uh, and this is one of those beautiful sequences uh, that you find in the suttas. Uh, yeah, the basic perception is the idea of impermanence that comes first. Uh, and we have just had one look at how that perception of impermanence works. Uh, but then the continuation of that is to understand that when things really are impermanent, uh, and it's very obvious that they are, yeah, the more you think about it, or the more you understand anicca, and it's very important to understand anicca in the right way. Very often we use this word impermanence in our lives. And I see this happening with Buddhists very often. Uh, they, and they think they know what it means, but they haven't really used that idea to properly understand what it relates to. You, know, you have to make it real in your own life, understanding what things the Buddha actually is, uh, uh, is talking about. Uh, and then once you make that clear, what it actually refers to, uh, then you start to understand why it is problematic, why it is suffering in your own life. If the world outside really is impermanent, uh, of course, it is going to be problematic. Yeah. And the basic reason why it is problematic yeah, is, of course, that we always attach to things. Uh, and as I mentioned the other day, is that attachment is not an option. Attachment is something that we have to do because attachment is an expression of the sense of self. Uh, as long as you have, have a sense of self, you are going to attach. That's what the sense of self does. You have no choice about it. And because we attach to things that are impermanent, you can see it is very problematic. Yeah, you try to hold on to something, but as you hold on to that thing, it is being pulled out of your grip. You cannot actually hold on to these things. And the simile that I like to use, it is, a, it is as if you are standing on a a carpet, yeah, a loose carpet somewhere, and standing here, it uh, symbolizes attachment. Yeah? Standing on something means that you are relying on it for support and all of these kind of things. And, yeah? So when you stand on something, uh, yeah, you are attached to it in a certain way, you're relying on it for support, uh, and then nature comes and pulls the carpet out from under your feet as you are standing on it. Uh, and of course, what happens when someone pulls the carpet uh, is that you fall over, yeah, and you fall over and you hurt yourself. Why? Because you are relying on something that cannot really be relied upon. That carpet is impermanent, that carpet is unreliable, quite literally being pulled out from under your feet. You fall over, and because you fall over, you suffer, you hurt yourself, maybe you break a bone, maybe who knows what happens as a consequence of that. That is a beautiful way of thinking about the idea of impermanence and unreliability. Yeah, you cannot take your stand anywhere. Yeah? You cannot rely on these things in the world. Uh, the moment you rely on them, uh, at that moment, uh, you're asking for suffering. Yeah? And uh, then, of course, the next step after that, and we'll have a look at this later on, is that those things that are suffering in the world, uh, whenever something is suffering, it is also non-self. It is anatta. If something is problematic, uh, it is not worthy to be taken as a self, as me, mine, all of these things. Yeah? You, uh, it is no longer, and that is kind of the final step that we take. Yeah? And we look at this afterwards, but now we want to focus on the idea of the, the suffering in, the, in what is impermanent. Uh, and uh, uh, already it is quite obvious to you, no doubt, uh, what is happening re with regarding to external things. I've been talking about this a lot. Uh, about the non-delight in the whole world, about the honor and praise and status and all of these kind of things, how uncertain they are and, and how eventually they must go. Uh, but now I want to look at this from a slightly different angle, just to kind of broaden out the uh, perspective a little bit. Uh, so how do we, under, how can we understand the idea of suffering in the impermanent? Uh, yeah? 
Uh, and uh, one way of doing that uh, is to do this through our meditation practice. Uh, and uh, uh, perhaps you think this is really difficult to do in meditation. Perhaps you think that this requires really deep insight, uh, but the answer is no, it doesn't require very profound insight. Uh, it is something that all of us can do to some extent if you know how to approach this. Uh, and the way to approach this is that uh, when we do ordinary meditation practice, yeah, and as I've been saying to you all along, when you meditate, make sure that you always contemplate the meditation afterwards. And, and what you do when you contemplate the meditation, you start to learn about whether you are peaceful or not, whether you really are tranquil or not. You start to see whether your mind is calming down, and you also start to understand the causes for why this is happening. Yeah. Now, one of the ideas, one of the important things uh, to understand, one of the things that you can focus on after your meditation is finished, uh, is to ask yourself uh, what happened in that meditation? Why is it uh, that the meditation is so pleasant? Why is it pleasant to be peaceful? Uh, why is it, why does joy even arise uh, when the mind comes down? Uh, and uh, one of the things that you will see as you do that, uh, you will start to see that in your meditation practice, uh, things start to fade away, they start to disappear, yeah? And as things fade away, and this is like uh, seeing impermanence in action, yeah? You're seeing your body becoming less important, uh, you're seeing maybe your five senses are turning off a little bit, uh, yeah? You don't, you, your eyes are closed, you cannot really see, uh, and as you turn inwards to the breath, even you hear perhaps a little bit less than you used to, uh, the five senses are gradually disappearing. You're going more inwards inside of yourself. We can see maybe your will is gradually disappearing a little bit. Yeah, you're becoming more peaceful. There's less doing inside. You can see some of the feelings that you have, like the painful feelings in the body, they are disappearing as well. Yeah, and as these things are disappearing, what is happening is that you feel more happy. Yeah, you start to feel better now. So uh, what you see is that all of these impermanent things in your life, all of these things that you can give up, uh, all of these things that you cannot really control, uh, you start to understand that these things are inherently problematic. Yeah? The five senses, the body, and uh, these things, be precisely because you can give them up, it means that they are impermanent. Uh, moreover, you understand them from the point of view of suffering. Uh, you look at them and you realize that when they have been given up through meditation practice, uh, you have become more peaceful, it is a happier state. Uh, and it is a happier state uh, precisely because these things, you have given up something that was impermanent, uh, something that was inherently problematic uh, when it was there. Uh, so you, uh, what happens when you look at things in this way uh, is that you attach less to these things. Uh, you start to understand that they actually are not all that interesting. Why? Because you reach a happier state when you actually abandon these things. You understand the suffering in this entire world around you, which is impermanent in this way. So this is just a preview of understanding the suffering in the impermanent. Yeah? The first thing is to understand that whenever you attach in the external world, you are asking for suffering because everything in the external world is impermanent. Uh, that is like the first stage. Uh, the second stage is to bring this into your meditation practice, uh, see things that are impermanent, see them fade away, and see how that leads to happiness for yourself. Uh, and it, it is very obvious, yeah, because a little bit of peace in your mind uh, is already a little bit of happiness. Uh, Later on, on this retreat, hopefully tomorrow, towards the very end, we're going to have a look at the Anapana Sati Sutta, the Sutta on Mindfulness of Breathing. And I will show you how this works in more detail when we come to that Sutta. But uh, for now, I'm going to let that be because we have a, a, a many more Suttas to uh, go through. So we'll just carry on from, uh, from here and see what this gets us. So the perception of suffering in, the, in what is impermanent, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, upasakas, and upasakas, when developed and cultivated, is of great fruit and great benefit, culminating in the deathless, having the deathless as its consummation. For what reason was this said? 
when a bhikkhu often dwells with a mind accustomed to the perception of suffering in the impermanent, a keen perception of danger becomes settled in him towards indolence, laziness, slackness, heedlessness, lack of effort, and unreflectiveness, just as towards a murderer with a drawn sword. <laughs> So uh, a murderer with a drawn sword, yeah, this is like uh, someone coming behind you ready to cut off your life because your life is impermanent, yeah? And that uh, you, you understand impermanence in this way as if someone is about to kill you at any time. But it is like a keen understanding of death, yeah, and how dying can come because death is one of the most profound ways of understanding impermanence. When you understand impermanence deeply, it is very similar to understanding the idea of dying because so much of the things that we attach to in this world are related to this life. So when you die, you have to give these things up. Yeah, this is kind of the idea here. So you can see here, one of the great outcomes of this perception of impermanence or suffering in the impermanent is that you become concerned about being indolent and lazy and slack and heedless and unreflective. Yeah? Interesting here that it has the idea of unreflective. Um, the idea that you are always thinking, you're always contemplating your existence. You're asking yourself whether you are attaching too much. You're asking yourself whether your mind is leaning in the right direction. You're asking yourself whether you are using yoni somanasikara, wise attention or unwise attention. Is your, are your positive, your wholesome states of kindness, etc., are they growing or are they going down? You're constantly reflecting on this because you understand that unless you reflect on these things, you will be subject to the suffering that is inherent in impermanence. So you don't want to attach, you want to avoid that, you want to move away from those things that lead to suffering in the world. So you become very careful with how you use your mind. You don't look for beauty in things that are unreliable, uncertain. And you always keep in mind, keep at the back of your mind the right view, the right outlook, the right values that give you the priorities that lead you in the right direction towards uh, away from the suffering towards greater contentment and happiness uh, with the simple things in life, the simple samatha, the simple samadhi, etc. And the Buddha goes on. If, when a bhikkhu often dwells with a mind accustomed to the perception of suffering in the impermanent, uh, uh, a keen perception of danger does not become settled in him towards indolence. Uh, Um, laziness, slackness, heedlessness, and lack of effort and, and reflectiveness, just as towards a murderer with a drawn sword, he should understand, I have not developed the perception of suffering in the impermanent. There is no distinction between my earlier condition and my present one. I have not attained the fruit of development. Thus, he clearly comprehends this. Yeah, he's always monitoring his uh, progress. He knows what is going on. And if he hasn't reached yet that uh, um, understanding fully, yeah, he hasn't attained the fruit of development yet, uh, then he knows he has to carry on. Uh, but if, when he often dwells with a mind accustomed to the perception of suffering in the impermanent, uh, a keen perception of danger becomes settled in him uh, towards indolence, uh, laziness, slackness, heedlessness, lack of effort, uh, and unreflectiveness, just as towards a murderer with a drawn sword, he should understand that I have developed the perception of suffering in the impermanent. There is a distinction between my earlier condition and my present one. I have attained the fruit of development. Thus, he clearly comprehends this. Yeah, so you have at the back of your mind this uh, seeing the uh, danger in things and always kind of being on the outlook, uh, not uh, grasping the things that really cause suffering in the world. Uh, and you turn your mind in the right direction, uh, not holding on too much. Uh, and then uh, this is what happens. Uh, when it was said, uh, the perception of suffering in the impermanent because uh, 
when developed and cultivated, uh, is of great fruit and benefit, uh, culminating in the deathless, uh, having the deathless as its consummation, it is because of this uh, that this uh, was said. So um, I have just talked a little bit about these three perceptions uh, with you because I think they are very interesting and no doubt you will recognize that these things are true and you will understand these they are not very they are profound in one sense but they're also easy to understand in another sense it is very obvious to us that these things must be true the world is inherently unreliable it is inherently uncertain and you can understand quite simply why that world if you're attached to it must lead you to suffer as a consequence but these things are also very profound. Yeah? Don't, uh, please don't uh, think too easily that you understand what is going on uh, because these things are like a gradual development. Uh, you may understand these things better than many other people in the world that uh, you may already be heading in the right direction. And that's marvelous. Yeah, it is to be rejoiced in that we have a kind of, we are on the right track when we're heading in the right direction. Uh, but that development you have is uh, also it's only part of the development that we can do. If we develop these things fully, we can see here how they lead all the way to Nibbana, culminating in the deathless. So these things have a lot of potential, yeah? And uh, as you uh, keep on reflecting on these things, I think gradually it is as if you gain clarity about the world, a greater understanding uh, of what the world actually is like. Yeah? To make this even more clear yeah, to what is going on here, I'm now going to move on to one of my favorite suttas, which uh, talks about this kind of impermanence in much more detail uh, and the danger in the sensory world in much, much more detail. It is not because I want to uh, you know, put you off the world and make you feel depressed and sad. I really don't. I want, it's exactly the opposite, uh, because I want you to value those things that really are worthy of valuing in the world. Uh, so let's uh, move on to this next sutta. Uh, actually, not, not the, uh, the Portalia sutta. Actually, one, one more down, please. Uh, that's the one, Portalia the Wandering, yeah, the one we had, uh, we're looking at. We, we already did that little short sutta in between. So now I want to look at Portalia the Wanderer. This is from the MN54, the Majjhima the middle length sayings of the Buddha, the 54th sutta uh, about Portalia. And uh, this particular sutta, it uh, has uh, some very beautiful similes. And those of you who have been on my retreats before, you will know exactly what this sutta is about. Uh, but uh, to me, these similes are so powerful and so interesting. They're worthwhile coming back to again and again and again. Uh, and it's interesting. I have, uh, recently, I was in Melbourne here in Australia, and I did a retreat in Melbourne. And of course, there too, I did this Portalia Sutta. And a number of people, they came up to me and they said, wow, now, after hearing about this Sutta for many years, finally now, it is sinking in. I'm starting to understand what this Sutta is about. Yeah, and this is the thing about this Sutta. They are gradual developments. You get gradual insight into these things. So please try to see these suttas with new eyes. Yeah, every time you come to them, uh, try to kind of uh, look at these things, uh, uh, just enjoy them and listen to them, uh, but see if you can gain a deeper insight every time uh, you come to them. And then they will always be fresh, they will always be interesting. Uh, never think that, oh, I've seen this before. Uh, yeah, because the moment you think I've seen this before and you kind of start yawning or whatever, then you lose the potential for insight, for growing in this uh, beautiful and marvelous teachings of the Buddha. So uh, let's get to this. So first of all, we have a short uh, introduction here, and I'll look at that, and then I will move on to the similes in a, in a second. Half. So this is, uh, it begins uh, in the normal way. This is a translation by uh, Bhante Sujato. So, uh, I have heard at one time the Buddha was staying in the land of the northern Apanas, uh, near the town of theirs called Apana. Then <clears throat> the Buddha robed up in the morning uh, and taking his bowl and robe, he entered Apana for arms. Uh, 
He wandered for hours in Arpada. After the meal on his return from arms rather, he went to a certain forest grove for the day's meditation. Having plunged deep into it, he sat at the root of a certain tree for the day's meditation. This is the uh, a standard way that you often see the Buddha in the suttas. And yeah, he was uh, living in a certain place, and very often the Buddha would travel around, uh, especially early on when he started out. Uh, and he would live near a town. It's always near a town, not in the town, yeah? Because he would live in the forest outside or in the grove outside. And then he would go in for arms in the morning, yeah? He would robe up in the morning, yeah? take his bowl, have the arms, eat his food, and then he would retire back into the forest again, yeah? going into a forest grove for the day's meditation. And it's interesting that even the Buddha would meditate. Yeah? You, you think that the Buddha, he was finished, the path, finished with the path, no need for him to meditate. The Buddha could just relax and uh, not do anything. Yeah? But no, he would still meditate. Uh, and uh, in part, it is because meditation is a pleasant abiding. Yeah? Even the Buddha would enjoy that because it is peaceful. It is happy. It is not uh, an ordinary life. Always having all this input into the senses uh, is much more painful. Uh, but also it is because the Buddha, he often would establish like the compassion meditation, you know, the compassion, the Maha Karuna, the great compassion. And he would establish that in such a way that he is kind of ready to teach people for their benefit. Yeah? One of the very important aspects of it for the Buddha is that you have compassion for people. In fact, it is important for any teacher really that you try to have compassion for the people you are teaching because then you will deliver much better what you're doing if you have a sense of compassion. Uh, but of course, for the Buddha, it is at a very, very high level. Uh, and he often develops this every time, uh, almost every day, to make sure that he has the right attitude to the people around him. Uh, so he sits down at the root of a certain tree. Then what happens is that Putalia, the householder, also approached that forest grove while going for a walk. He was well dressed in a cloak and a sarong with parasol and sandals. Having plunged deep into it, he went up to the Buddha and exchanged greetings with him. When the greetings and polite conversation were over, he stood to one side and the Buddha said to him, There are seats, householder. Please sit if you wish. So here you have this householder, yeah, the, uh, the important, uh, some of the important words here are like parasol and sandals. Uh, and the reason why these words are important is because these are words of status uh, in ancient India. If you wander around with a parasol and sandals, uh, it means that you, are, you, are, you consider yourself to be of a certain high status. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, as we shall see later on, this person is a little bit uh, conceited, yeah, and uh, this is kind of indicating a little bit that kind of conceit. Uh, still, he was interested in the Dhamma, he was interested in the teachings, and that is why he is uh, seeking out people like the Buddha. Yeah? So the Buddha, uh, he goes to the Buddha, and they have the polite conversation, you will notice how Always the Buddha makes people feel at ease and feel relaxed, yeah? And they say, how are you? Where have you come from? Oh, nice to see you again. I hope you are keeping well, that you have enough to eat and all of these kind of things uh, that you see elsewhere in the suttas, how they greet each other. And then, of course, very kindly, the Buddha says, well, please take a seat, yeah, and sit down. Uh, why? Well, because when people are relaxed and when they are at ease, uh, they are more ready to hear the Dhamma. So please, Sit if you wish, and he replies. Oh, sorry, he doesn't reply at all because uh, I have cut out the next part of the sutta, but there's no reply to that one. That is just the introduction, and uh, I have cut out a large part because I want to get down to what matters. And uh, these are now the similes. So after the Buddha uh, says to Potalia, please sit down there. And, uh, uh, the, uh, put, uh, the Buddha asks Potala, well, what are you doing? What is your practice? Uh, and Potala says, well, I have cut off all my affairs, everything in my life. Uh, and the Buddha points out, well, you still look like a householder. Yeah, so if you look like a householder, how can 
how, what do you mean that you have cut off all your affairs? And then Potalia asks the Buddha to please teach him the deeper meaning of this. What does it mean to cut off all affairs in the Buddha's teachings? And to make this point, the Buddha then gives these similes. Yeah, these similes are a way of showing how to cut off one's affairs. In other words, how to reduce attachment to the world and to move towards the spiritual life and the meditation life in particular. So this is what comes up next. So the Buddha says to Potalia, he says, Householder, suppose a dog weak with hunger was hanging around a butcher's shop. Then a deft butcher or their apprentice would toss that dog a skeleton yeah, or a bone, if you like, scraped clean of flesh but smeared in blood. What do you think, householder? Gnawing on such a fleshless bone, would that dog get rid of its hunger? No, sir. Why not? Because that bone is scraped clean of flesh and smeared in blood. Blood. That dog will eventually get weary and frustrated. In the same way, a noble disciple reflects. With the simile of a skeleton, the Buddha has said that sensual pleasures, you know, or the sensual objects, if you like, give little gratification and much suffering and distress, and they are all the more full of drawbacks. Having truly seen this with the right understanding, that person rejects equanimity based on diversity and develops only equanimity based on unity, where all kinds of grasping to the world's material delights cease without remainder. So this is uh, the, uh, one of the famous similes of the Buddha, and you can see this simile in a number of places of the, in, in the suttas. Uh, and um, so here you have this dog, yeah? And uh, uh, of course, a dog, you know, is always desperate to get some food. You can imagine this kind of dog in India where nobody is really looking after it or trying to uh, support it. It kind of has to fend for itself. It doesn't really have an owner. Yeah? Some of these dogs, they just run around, they're kind of semi wild and they look really in a terrible state. Uh, and of course, they will go to the butcher shop because it is hoping that there will be a nice butcher in that shop. Uh, but of course, a butcher is not going to waste any valuable meat on a dog. Yeah, a butcher is going to use the meat to sell to somebody, to make a living, to support his family or whatever. So the dog waits outside and waits and waits and waits. And eventually, all it gets is a bone. And that bone, uh, of course, is smeared with blood. And when that dog uh, gnaws that bone, yeah, it kind of bites into that bone. Uh, all it does is get the taste of me, the taste of blood, but no sustenance, uh, nothing to really support it, uh, nothing to actually give it any um, it, anything to carry on with its life. All it does uh, is increasing the craving of the dog even more. Uh, it comes to that butcher shop full of craving, desiring food. Uh, and this is why you see the, uh, what is the uh, expression here? Yeah, it says here the dog, which is weak with hunger, yeah? Weakness with hunger is like a word which means craving. Yeah, we're running around craving for things in the world that we are weak with hunger, trying to satisfy our craving, yeah, but never really finding that satisfaction. Yeah. And then the dog eventually, the dog uh, gnaws on this bone, yeah. and of course, after a while, as it says, it gets weary and frustrated. Yeah. And because it gets weary and frustrated, it throws the bone to one side. Yeah then runs on to the next butcher shop and in the same way waits out the, outside the next butcher shop yeah and hangs around the next butcher shop and the next butcher is just as stingy as the previous one because all butchers are the same they need to make money they need to actually make a living because they have a family and relations and all of these kind of things and again the dog just gets a bone smeared with blood again the craving gets even stronger because it can taste the blood but there's no real sustenance. And because there's no real sustenance, the dog is still as hungry, still as much craving as before. In fact, even more craving. Runs off to the next butcher shop. 
And in this way, the dog keeps on running and running from one butcher to the next one until eventually it dies of old age. And then when it dies of old age, it gets reborn again. And when it gets reborn, it becomes a small little puppy, a cute little puppy. And then it's mummy. When does a mummy takes the puppy? It takes the puppy to the butcher shop. And when it takes the, uh, takes the puppy to the butcher shop, it all starts over again from scratch, running from one butcher to the next one, again and again, life after life, never understanding that the problem of running, that is actually the problem. The problem of craving is where all of these things start. There is no satisfaction with going from butcher to butcher. And of course, the point that the Buddha is making here is that our lives as human beings are very much like this dog. Yeah, We are running after the things of the world. We are running after relationships and trying to find satisfaction in relationships. And then even though that relationship is smeared with blood, yeah, there is some satisfaction in that relationship. You get the taste of something. There is some satisfaction in that. Then at the same time, that relationship itself is impermanent. And because it is impermanent, maybe someone leaves you, or maybe they die, or maybe you die. Who knows what happens? Then after that relationship is over, what do you do? You go into another one. You're trying to find satisfaction again. And the same problem arises. That relationship, too, is impermanent. They die, they, um, they leave you, or you leave them, or whatever happens. And then you have to start over again, again and again and again, each time trying to find the full satisfaction in the relationship. But in the end, yeah, you realize actually relationships are okay, but relationships are also inherently problematic. Because if you have a very good relationship, you will keep be attached. And then when the impermanence of nature comes and draws you away, pulls you away from that relationship, then you will have to suffer as a consequence because that is just the nature of things when you attach to things. And then, so this is what our lives are like, yeah? running around, trying to find satisfaction, traveling here, traveling there, eating new kinds of food, trying to find some kind of lasting happiness in that world, always thinking that the next time around is going to give more satisfaction, it's going to be more, uh, you're going to be more contented with the result uh, and never really working out. Uh, and then one day the penny starts to drop, but that world of the five senses uh, is never going to give it that kind of satisfaction. Uh, and the reason why it is not going to give satisfaction uh, is because the problem of craving is something inside of us. Uh, the reason why we crave is because we are really looking for some kind of happiness that is very profound. We're looking for a deep sense of satisfaction, a deep sense of contentment. Uh, There's almost as if there is a lack inside of us, uh, a hole inside of us that needs to be filled. Uh, and we're trying to fill a psychological hole, a psychological something missing with external objects. Uh, we cannot fill a psychological problem uh, with external things. Uh, it is never going to work. Uh, that thing missing inside of us, uh, as soon as we get our fill of sensual pleasures, uh, not long after that, we start to feel empty again. Uh, we start to feel that we need more. Uh, and then we run after more things in that world. Uh, but the problem is really an internal one. Uh, and when you under understand that the problem is an internal one, uh, you start to change your strategy. Uh, you look for contentment, you look for happiness, uh, you look for satisfaction. Uh, in an entirely different place. Uh, you look for that satisfaction within instead. Uh, and that is what the spiritual path is, uh, is about. Uh, and when you look for satisfaction within, uh, then what you do is you start to understand that you want to build up uh, a happiness inside of yourself. Uh, yeah, A happiness that is independent of external things. Uh, a happiness that has nothing to do with craving, with this eternal running around but actually is inside of yourself. And that happiness is the happiness that comes from kindness, the happiness that comes from generosity, the happiness that comes from stillness and samadhi by giving up that world which never really can be satisfying. And if you look very carefully at 
the happiness that comes through kindness, through practicing the spiritual path, and the happiness that comes by giving up the external world, by becoming still inside, and it has a different quality to it. And it has a quality that has nothing to do with craving. In fact, it is the opposite of craving because it is an immediate happiness that you experience within yourself. And yeah, I'm happy now. I don't need to go anywhere else. And because you don't need to go anywhere else, it has nothing to do with craving and attachment in the external world. And as you build that inner happiness up, yeah, and this is what we do in the spiritual practice, it becomes stronger and stronger, more and more satisfying. And when you attain eventually a state of samadhi, which is the full satisfaction inside, you understand that you have finally found the thing that you were looking for all along. That is the whole point of a spiritual path, that drive of craving in the external world, which promises to give you satisfaction, but can never actually give that satisfaction. One day you find that on the spiritual path instead through samadhi practice. One day the craving dies down completely and you feel 100% content inside of you. Imagine what that feels like to be 100% content. Imagine what it feels like to be so blissed out that you don't want anything else in the entire world. Utterly and completely satisfied. What that means is that you have found the very meaning of life itself, yeah? Because the meaning of life, the craving that drives you on, the desire that drives you on to new things all the time, uh, well, that desire, it wants to find the solution. It wants to find the end point of craving. Yeah? Now you have found that end point uh, by turning inside instead, turning away from the external craving and turning within to something that is truly satisfactory. Yeah? And you have uh, in a very profound sense, found the very answer to the meaning of life. That is what this really is about. And when you have found the answer to the meaning of life, that is why there is no craving in that state. Because if you have found the meaning, there's nothing more to look for. Yeah, if, if you have found the purpose, if you have found the highest happiness, if you have found true satisfaction, there's nowhere else to go. There's no, there's no desire that actually can drive you on anymore. Why? Because you have found, already found what you're looking for. That is why in Samadhi you actually do find that the true meaning, the true purpose, the things that actually are, the things that we have been looking for all along, but we always were looking in the wrong place. So this is that idea of, you know, of the dog and the bone. And it's very useful to try to understand how this simile actually works in your own life, yeah? And try to see how you are drug driven all the time to do things, uh, how we always, um, you know, when you wake up in the morning, how you're driven to do one thing after the other, uh, always being moved on by this world around us. Uh, and that dr drivenness in this world, that craving, the desire that makes you work really hard and makes you uh, look after people, look after the world, all of these things when you are driven in your life, all of that uh, is really that same thing. Yeah, we are running around trying to find that satisfaction, trying to build things up, uh, trying to make things right. Uh, and all that drivenness, uh, all that craving, that is what the simile of the dog is. Uh, so try to see this clearly in your own life. And as you see that, uh, Remember that that search in that world yeah, will never actually give you that satisfaction. And when you do that, when you start to see that this is a problem, you start to take that world less seriously. Yeah? You still live in that world. You still act in the right way on an external level. It may seem like you're living pretty much in the same way. You still have to make a living. Yeah, you have no choice if you have children and a family. And even if you just have to feed yourself, you just still have to make a living. But your attitude is different. Uh, you don't have the same kind of craving anymore. You're no longer so obsessed with it. Uh, when you work, you don't work just to get things finished. You don't work to try to satisfy your employer because if you satisfy your employer, then you will be happy. No, you work in a mindful way, in a smart way. Yeah? And you don't really care so much if you, even if you get fired or even if uh, other people uh, don't appreciate what you're doing. It doesn't matter so much to you anymore. Why? 
because you know that the satisfaction in life is not to be found there. So your attitude to the world changes. You're not so driven anymore. The desire, the craving is no longer in charge. Instead, what is in charge is the right view, the understanding where that satisfaction actually can be found. Okay, so let us uh, have a quick look at the uh, next uh, simile. Uh, and uh, this one is also, I think, a very profound one, a very useful one to keep in mind. Uh, suppose a vulture or a crow or a hawk was to grab a lump of meat and fly away. Other vultures, crows, and hawks would keep chasing it, pecking and clawing. What do you think, householder, if that vulture, crow, or hawk doesn't quickly let go of that lump of meat, wouldn't that result in death or death-like suffering for that bird? Yes, sir. Yeah, and then the Buddha says, in the same way, a noble disciple uh, reflects in this way, with a simile of the lump of meat. Uh, the Buddha has said that sensual pleasures give little gratification and much suffering and distress, uh, and they are all the more full of drawbacks. Uh, having truly seen this with the right understanding, they reject equanimity based on diversity uh, and develop only the equanimity based on unity, uh, where all kinds of grasping to the world's material delights uh, Seeks without anything left over. So um, uh, here we have this. Uh, uh, actually, I should really, I didn't really fully uh, finish off the previous uh, passage because I should really have talked about that uh, last part as well the idea of uh, uh, truly understanding the problem, yeah, with running around like a dog. Yeah, and um, and then rejecting the equanimity based on diversity and developing the equanimity based on unity, what does that mean? And it's actually an important point. So the, the point of that is that you, because you understand the problem in the world, you understand the problem, the world is always going to be problematic, there's nothing in that world which is really interesting, you actually, eventually, you reject that world entirely. And uh, it is not enough just to have equanimity with, with regard to that world. Uh, you have to go deeper. You have to find, as I mentioned before, satisfaction somewhere else on the spiritual path. Uh, that is why you let go of the equanimity based on diversity and you develop the equanimity based on unity instead. Yeah? And when you have that equanimity based on unity, all kinds of grasping to the world's material delights uh, they cease without anything left over. So this is the final point. This is the final purpose of these kind of reflections, yeah? that you stop grasping to the world's material delights because you understand they cannot deliver. They cannot actually give what you're looking for. So every one of these similes, they have the same conclusion where you give up grasping the world's delights and uh, because you understand the limits of these things and you move instead towards a more profound um, experience of the world, a more profound experience of reality. Uh, that, of course, is the experience we have through meditation practice. So I was going to talk about the simile of the lump of meat, uh, but uh, uh, um, yeah, okay, okay, let's talk about that simile very briefly. We have a few minutes left, yeah, so because uh, it is, uh, I've already read it out, so I might as well uh, talk a little bit about it, uh, yeah. Uh, and so this uh, bird, yeah, grabbing a lump of meat. Uh, and of course, when you grab a lump of meat, a lump of meat is something valuable to a bird, and other birds also want that lump of meat. Uh, so they chase you, they come after you, they try to rip that lump of meat from your claws because they also they are greedy and they don't care about the consequences for you and if you don't let go of that lump of meat what happens well you may even die as a consequence or if you don't die at the very least you get a lot of suffering because of that 
And uh, of course, the lump of meat here is a simile for the all the things of the world, all the things that we attach to, all the things that we hold on to. And the idea here is that we always fight over the things of the world. Yeah, we always want the same things. And a typical thing that we want the same of is we often want the same partners. We want the same people in our lives. Yeah, we fight over the same kind of people. And there's so much jealousy. There is so much conflict in the world because we want the same boyfriend or the same girlfriend. And we're always trying to kind of, and once we get that girlfriend, then we, uh, or boyfriend, we get jealous of them because maybe they are, we are always worried that they might leave us or they might find someone else, etc. So uh, it is endless, this competition over the things in the world, especially relationships. Uh, or it can, can have to do with work, yeah, with work where we are fighting to gain the promotion or to gain the salary increase. And there's so much conflict at work because everyone is trying to uh, move ahead and to kind of beat your other employees in that company. Uh, it can be when you die and there is an inheritance to be had. Yeah, that inheritance, we fight over the inheritance after our parents have passed away. Uh, it can be more simple things, yeah, like when you, uh, there is a, a children fighting over a toy or fighting over a, a, a suite or something like that. Uh, uh, and the basic problem is that the world has a limited supply of things. Uh, yeah, there is only the uh, cake, the economy is only so large, uh, and there's only so much to be divided up. Uh, and because of that, the world is inherently problematic. Uh, the world is inherently fraught with conflict and arguments and trying to beat the other people. Why? Because there is a limited resources in this world and because there's limited resources we're going to fight over those resources and the reason why this is so interesting to me is that it shows you that the world outside the world of the sensory objects around us it is inherently full of conflict inherently full of rivalry inherently full of violence and all of these kind of things. Why? Because we want the same things. So when you have sensual desire on the one hand, when you have attachments to the objects of the world, there's always going to be conflict in that world. Yes, that whole world is really so uh, problematic because this, and this is why ill will is very closely related to sensual desires and the sensual world. Because uh, if we don't get that central object that we are after, we get disappointed. Ill will is often just behind. Yeah, it is very easy. It follows behind very closely. So sensual desire and ill will they go hand in hand. We cannot really distinguish them from each other. So that world of sensory desire is actually very unsatisfactory because it brings with you all of these negative consequences with it. And the alternative to that external world is the world of the mind again, yeah? And with the world of the mind, it is so different because with the world of the mind, instead of fighting over external things, instead we focus on the happiness within and the, and the contentment inside. And if we focus on the contentment inside and the happiness within, well, that happiness that we have within ourselves is not to be shared with anyone outside. It doesn't lead to conflict because it is yours. Yeah, it belongs to your mind alone. It is not something that uh, anyone can take away from you. And in fact, the happiness within has the exact opposite effect because the happiness within actually makes you a more peaceful, a more calm, a more caring, a more kind being. So actually building up the internal qualities instead of lead leading to rivalry, leading to conflict, leading to violence, leading to all of these problems in our world, it leads instead to peace. It leads to unity. It leads to understanding. It leads to uh, mutual appreciation of each other. And that is why it is such a, uh, diff uh, such a different way of uh, dealing with the world, if you like, yeah, than the ordinary way of uh, always having a rivalry about what is happening in the world. So uh, uh, I, I don't know, but this is, you know, it's quite powerful because it means that uh, there's something inherently problematic with the world. Uh, 
as long as there is sensual desires, as long as there is an attachment to the sensual objects of the world, that there's always going to be a rivalry here. There's always going to be problems as a consequence of that. Uh, whereas if we go within, within, then the exact opposite is going to be true. Uh, so I'm going to have to leave you at that. Uh, and uh, uh, so please, everyone, please have a nice lunch together. Uh, and uh, I'll be back again at 12.30, and we will carry off these marvelous suttas at 12.30.